no Mickey show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Wednesday, October 13th, and we are coming to you live from Edinburgh, Scotland, where the TED Climate Summit is taking place. Uh, many of you may know that COP uh, is going to be taking place, 26, COP26 is taking place not too far away in Glasgow in a couple of weeks. That is the uh, event where world leaders come together and talk about how they are going to and their governments are going to be dealing with climate change and the impending disaster. Just today, the UN issued a report that the UK, the United Kingdom, where this summit is taking place, is extremely unprepared for climate change and referenced many of the disasters that occurred just this last year, not only in the UK, but other parts of Europe, including flooding and massive fires. Uh, you're not, this isn't news to you guys on our show. So you're wondering, okay, well, why are you at a TED conference? <laughs> Great question. That's what I wanted. Great question. Um, we are covering the TED Countdown Conference. It is the first of its kind, and it's an interesting mix of folks. You have some world leaders, like the uh, First Minister of Scotland here, uh, who spoke today. She's she's a female leader. Um, and then you have industry leaders. Uh, you have climate activists. You have indigenous activists. Uh, and... If you were welcomed into the room as I was today, <laughs> uh, you could have actually sat right before a representative from Amazon. I went to a lunch today, and out of curiosity mostly, uh, to see what on earth Amazon had to say about its role in impacting the environment and what they're going to do about it. And so we listened to the sustainability, uh, the person in charge of sustain sustainability for Amazon in Europe make his case. Now, what I'm going to show you, and you definitely don't want to shut down the show right now because it's about to get good. Uh, what I'm going to show you right now is a couple of the questions that came from the audience. Just some backstory here. This was a lunch. Uh, he, he, they, they, the, 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 the Amazon uh, representative he answered questions from a former journalist for The Guardian. Um, there was some pushback on how the journalist was conducting himself in terms of, you know, giving a little bit more of a runway and space and having a little bit more empathy towards the Amazon representative than uh, the folks asking what I believe were, were pretty simple questions, not anything that you should be prepared to answer, uh, even if it's outside of your arena. You're showing up at a climate event. Uh, climate is not something that's siloed off. I think most of us would understand that, in the case of my question, uh, tax money, you know, what you are taxed and where those tax dollars go can affect how you protect yourself as a society from the effects of climate change, especially in communities where a company like Amazon has actually uh, hurt the infrastructure and has uh, prevented, you know, uh, sustainability from occurring because, you um, because of the tax incentives, and 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 not only that, you know, gentrification um, puts more of the climate change effects on people who are being displaced or who do not have the same, um, you know, the same resources to to install solar panels and build walls and uh, do all of the things that rich people are doing right now to protect themselves from the effects of climate change. So there are a few questions that came up, and. I want to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, it was, if, out of context, there were several questions that were asked. We're going to play this in the order of the questions asked. As the questions were being asked, the tougher questions were being asked, uh, folks were being shut down, mics were being pulled away. So by the end, when I asked my question, there was a sense of urgency in getting it out and using my voice in the moment I was there to, 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 to ask a very specific question, as I think many others felt the same. Uh, the beginning, it started off very calmly with some tough questions, and then um, 
there was one gentleman in particular who was asked to sit down and not talk anymore. And a few people in the front who uh, were older and and definitely white, which is you know important to say, uh, clapped when they asked him to be respectful and not come back with a follow-up question. I came up with a follow-up question. No one asked me to be quiet. Um, I also just kept talking. <laughs> so I, 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 I want to share this with you because um, I, I knew coming to the summit that it would only be worthwhile for me to be able to ask these questions of these folks who are not used to being around uh, reporters who, who work in climate, activists who work on the front lines of climate change. And, uh, you know, and they really should be asked difficult questions or in, in the case of, I think our I think the question is pretty simple. You know, you should be able to ask about your labor policies and why, you know, workers aren't able to unionize. You should be able to ask questions about uh, tax policy and how not paying taxes actually affects your climate policies. You should be able to answer questions about greenwashing. I mean, these are the questions that they actually answer at Davos. Davos! Why can't they answer them in a room of activists? And is that ultimately it? is they're willing to answer some of these questions when uh, they're handed to them in advance on a piece of paper and it's a, a journalist who works with them or it's on a world stage and they can perfectly craft their message and they don't want to have to do it when uh, they're activists who understand the impacts of of uh, what a company like Amazon does to the environment, to indigenous people, to folks on the front lines, and ultimately all of society. So I don't have the entire talk. I, I, I am sorry. I think that will probably go up online publicly at some point. But um, these if these videos were shared with me from somebody else. Uh, they did not come from me. I did not film these. So I, I I do appreciate this person sharing this footage with me. And later we'll come back and give them credit. Um, but these are some of the questions that were asked of the Amazon executive. Thank you. My name is Anthony Meyer, a labor rights activist from Los Angeles. And this conversation is largely focusing on the role of corporate social responsibility. And so I want to make sure we touch on people as well as the planet. As well as the planet. So I have two questions. Um, first, I'd love for you to talk a bit more about corporate tax evasion um, and the role of paying taxes in Amazon. <laughs> And second, I would love for you to talk about the opportunity for your workers to unionize. We might just point you on these questions, uh, and I don't feel especially qualified to talk about them, but, uh, you know, other than to say on tax, like, I believe, and I think Amazon believes that we should make a contribution to society by paying the taxes required of us. I mean, a non-controversial statement, but that's... You know, it's my point of view, the company's point of view. Um, on unionization, I um, honestly, I'm going to skip that one. I just, I don't have a, I don't have a line for you there. So again, would love to talk. I, I think we're going to take this session a little bit more informal later. But um, yeah, and, and I think one of the issues, isn't it, is that you know, when I started out in this, you know, sustainability was one thing, and now actually it's everything. Yeah. And so, um, so actually, um, it's interesting about how that gets managed within any company. That you know, what, what I hear you saying is that you don't deal with the tax and you don't deal not with labour, but but actually those are critical issues that you can't ignore. So, so I mean, it's a bit like everything's interconnected, everything's involved, and so actually, I, I think the. I think the, the comment behind the question is that you cannot look at climate unless you look at labor, unless you look at tax, because all those things are interconnected. And, and Zach, like many uh, people trying to make change, will only have certain responsibilities. Um, and that is sometimes a, a lack within a corporation, because actually, how do you deal with everything? And who deals with everything? And who is implemented? So actually, it's deeply complex, I think Zach is saying. I can't, I, I'm well, doing this bit, but I can't do everything. Is that what you're saying? Sir? Well, I mean, I think as a company, we recognize that like, you, can't, you can't untangle environmental and social issues. So I like, just echo what, you, what, you, what you're saying. And I, you know, um, you know I, I think we are but it's, like, proud of the workplaces we, that we create. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, the conditions in our buildings, I think we feel good about the, the, pay, the pay we pay to our associates. 
I'm Deanne Drown. I'm from Texas, from the U.S., and I'm the Executive Director of Intersectional Environmentalist. And last year, we had an interesting engagement with a lot of corporations in an accountability program. A lot of people who are venturing towards programming that you're trying to develop, I'm sure, behind the scenes. And one of the key opportunities that we saw that I think a lot of people are addressing here today is that there's a lot of lack of accountability with a lot of these solutions being community-informed. And I wonder if you could share maybe some of the opportunity that you're seeing with what you're developing and maybe even in the conversations that are happening here to connect directly with people who can help inform the solutions that you're building and build those pathways for communication so that there's less confusion about some of the issues that are happening and the way that Amazon is addressing it. Which, which comes back to the whole issue of humility as well, which is as a corporation, how does a corporation engage at the grassroots level and whether, how, how that happens? Right, so more so, what are those immediate opportunities for direct engagement and open long-term lines of communication? And just for a little bit of context, a lot of people in this movement, particularly young people who are doing a tremendous amount of work on social media to try and educate, you know, share widespread information, Sometimes we're brought in and are given a two-day, one-day crash course on what companies are developing. We know that's not enough time. We need long-term relationships with people to be able to educate our peers. So yeah, just any opportunities that you're seeing to build those long-term relationships directly with communities. Great. And, and also, Zach, on top of that, so I'm on the board of a youth activist group called um, Force of Nature. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this whole issue now. We've had greenwashing, now we have youth washing which is a lot of young people being involved, in, invited into corporates, but yeah. more for the show of it, but not actually truly uh, engaging them. So and that just to add to what you were saying. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, engage, engaging with externally at the community level is, is super important for us to build out a really robust sustainability strategy. Um, I welcome sort of thoughts and feedback on how we do that scalably. I mean, of course, we've done it. We've done it with kind of organisations like Global Optimism that kind of got us in this place in, in the first place with the Climate Pledge. We work with you know larger NGOs, and I think that's not really what you're talking about. You're talking about like direct community action, and um, you know we have examples of where we're starting to do that. Some of our sort of urban greening projects in Europe. We announced in the last couple of weeks that we are. Uh, deploying some of our kind of right night climate fund money into urban greening projects in, you know, ideally in, in sort of more economically and socially deprived areas within northern Italy. So there's a kind of, you know, there's an intersection of having a sort of environmental as well as a social benefit. Um, I think what we're, what we're wrangling with and wrestling with is like how there are so many people we could go engage with, right? Like, and we like to do things at an operate scale. How do we, how does, this sort of giant Amazon machine interact at the community level. And we have you know, Helen here from, from my team who is starting to think about this from a Europe perspective. We have a team in the US that's also thinking about external engagement. And we have, it being Amazon, we have a, a few other teams in similar spaces doing kind of in the community work. Um, so the, 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 the idea is there, the intent is there, like how do we, how do, we do it in a way that's effective, not the one day, two day workshop. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's an open question. Right? So I, I want to be respectful. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Stone, and I'm a 21 year old student, youth climate activist in New York City. And I did have a question about the climate pledge specifically, but the DPA did want to thank you for the questions that you asked. Um, I'm curious to know your response to criticisms of the climate pledge and greenwashing the work that you're doing, because I live in New York City, and everywhere I go, I'm on a subway, I get climate pledge ads, I'm watching TV, prime time, I'm getting ads. Um, with very hollow responses of work that hasn't been done yet by the pledge. I see um, billboards on Times Square on multiple buildings. So for the work that has yet to be done, how is the climate pledge spending millions of dollars on advertising, especially in the most expensive advertising market? Um, can you respond to criticisms of greenwashing for the pledge specifically? Thank you. Yes, I don't think the pledge is about greenwashing. Um, I being on the inside of the company, this isn't just about a hollow commitment, it's about making real changes. And, you know, it's not just about forward looking commitments either. Like, you know, we are now five percent of our business is powered by renewables, or one part to, to get out of it by twenty twenty five hundred percent. So these are these are real changes. You're right that we are communicating. You spent millions of dollars, though, on advertising. I mean, he, I'd like an answer to my question. I am respecting. I'd like my question answered. 
Okay. I'd like an answer, though. So I, I just want to stop here for a moment because, um, you know, this is a really interesting debate and also I want you to be respectful in the sense that um, I'm someone who's been challenging businesses for a long time, but I don't want, ev- I don't want Zach here to be the target of everyone's sort of eye. The fact is that, yes, Amazon, like many corporations, is not doing enough that it has to do more. But what we're here to do is to focus on the fact that it is trying to do something. And while that should be challenged, also I want there to be a sort of, um, you know, Zach is not the problem. You know, Zach is doing his best within a corporation to, go, to bring about change. So I just want it to be, I recognise there's a lot of issues here with Amazon, and I feel them too. And also I want to sort of be fair to Zach in this as well. So uh, I get that, but I just want it to be a sort of balanced conversation as well, because that is not the problem. Uh, Amazon is not the problem, it's a problem. The system is the problem. And in fact, there's no <laughs> company, as I said, is going to solve this. But anyway, um, let's carry on. Hi, Zach. My name is Nobiki Kunst, and I am from Astoria, New York, which is Queens, which is part of Long Island City. Uh, for those of you who don't know where that is, that is a location that was speaking all these things. Just about a month ago, there were many homes in that area that were flooded. Twelve people died in New York because of climate change, because we had massive floods that we were not prepared for or even knew were going to happen. Now, if, say, corporations, real estate developers were taxed, we may have been able, as a city, as the largest city in the country, to protect some of these people. You know, we don't know for sure, but there is absolutely a correlation between whether or not a company is paying taxes, in the U.S. in particular, and how we as cities and communities all over the country are able to protect the most vulnerable people. Many of these people are undocumented. So I'm asking as a company, are you willing to directly invest via tax dollars? And just want to respond to one point you made. You said, well, we respond to the tax policies we have. Um, You also invest in a lot of lobbying to make sure that you don't have to pay those taxes in the United States. So are you willing as a company, and I know it's just you, but has there been any discussion with Mr. Bezos, uh, who received tax benefits for his rocket to space? Um, Are you willing to address that elephant in the room, which is tax money, goes to investing in preparing us and protecting us from the ecological disasters that are often contributed by your use of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Mm. I, I appreciate there's a lot of, I can sense there's a lot of kind of anger and frustration with Amazon on issues that I'm not, as I said, like I'm not super well qualified to talk about. I, I'm actually, I'm not familiar with the situation you're describing, so yeah. I think it'll be irresponsible for me to you know, frankly, answer your question one way or another. Yeah, so, 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 hold on, no, no, no. So, just, just to be clear, a question has been asked about that, and Zach has responded to that. No, no, I, no, I, no, I think. Pay taxes. I'm saying, are you willing to make it a company decision to not lobby anymore to not have the tax? But, you're, but, but I think, I think, I think, what, what, so I think this is a really interesting conversation. But I think that you're asking Zach to answer things that he is not able to, to respond to directly. So he's, you know, I think, I think when you ask people a question that they have a responsibility for, I think that's a really fair thing to say, but to, to ask him consistently questions that he cannot answer, I think is great for him, and you know, I think this is a really useful for Zach to hear that. Great to listen. Because, <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm more interested just for a moment, Zach in, in. And there you have it. All right. Our first guest today is the one and only Stephen Donziger. He is, of course, the attorney who has now been sentenced to six months for, mm, let me get this right, defeating Chevron in court and demanding that they pay what they're owed to the indigenous communities. That's more or less what happened. Uh, he'll explain a little bit about the state of his 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 uh, situation and his sentencing and um, and really, you know, what this means for the climate movement right now. And then later on, we have Josh Fox, who's going to be joining us to talk about other issues related to, co- to, uh, to climate, 
this is Climate Week, if you didn't know this. Uh, we are covering climate here in Edinburgh, and you might actually get some special interviews uh, in between shows this week as I'm able to sit down with folks and talk with them about their work on climate, because there are some brilliant and beautiful activists here. Uh, it's not just Amazon <laughs> executives. <laughs> But I'm hoping to get uh, as much content related to what they're thinking as well, because it's important for us to understand where they are. All right, we'll be right back with the one and only attorney, Stephen Donziger. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. We are excited to welcome back Stephen Donziger, who is, of course, an attorney. Uh, he battled Chevron, defeat Chevron, representing indigenous communities who are affected by the practices of Chevron and Texaco in the Amazon, and uh, recently was sentenced. We're skipping over a few steps here, but he'll explain it. Uh, he was recently sentenced for six months in the Southern District of New York, where he actually defeated uh, these folks before. Uh, this was in response to a, a RICO suit, <laughs> which, you know, if, if, if you did not have faith in our system before, you're going to lo lose a lot more faith now uh, after hearing this story. Uh, welcome back to the show, Stephen. And thank you for giving us your time. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate it. So I was um, down outside the courthouse uh, right before the sentencing hearing, and it was incredible to see how many different types of people came together to support you. The cameras, um, it's, 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 it's wonderful that this is getting the attention needed. But simultaneously, I have to say to you, I'm at a climate summit right now in Scotland, and uh, crickets. No one has said a single thing about Stephen Donziger, and I'm getting ready to throw that in at some point, by the way, just, okay. just be ready. Um, uh, but they've you know talked a lot about you know uh, the, the typical sustainability talk. I, you know I, I had so much hope seeing everybody out there, and then of course the sentencing came back, which I you know I'm not surprised by it. But you know I, 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 I led with this kind of context because on one hand the movement feels so alive and so ready for action, yet on the other hand the powers that be are so strong and just resistant to even recognizing what's outside. You know, the activists outside protesting Amazon, um, who's here, and the activists outside of, of, of the courtroom. When you walked in that courtroom, did, did you know what you were getting into? Did you, did you have a feeling as to what was going to happen with the judge? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I mean, I, I think you're, there's a huge amount of support being generated um, behind me and, and really what my case stands for. I mean, this goes well beyond me. It goes to whether or not we can live in a free society where lawyers can do their jobs and activists can do their advocacy without being put in jail or fined or disabled through various legal mechanisms. And, you know, we're seeing this trend around the world. You know, you, you, I've seen it in so many countries as someone who follows these issues in, in Hungary and Poland and Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, just to name a few, where you know, authoritarian leaders you weaponize the law against their political opponents and they create these fake cases to make them look real and they neutralize people, take their money, lock them up, what have you. And like we're seeing that trend now start to penetrate the United States of America. And I think the clearest example is this case against me where I worked for, you know, two decades with indigenous peoples in Ecuador to win this significant pollution judgment only to face literally 10 years of legal attacks without a jury um, from dozens, hundreds really of Chevron lawyers who I think captured an element of our federal judiciary and turned it against me. Just to be clear why I'm locked up in my home now for 799 days, if you can believe it, on a misdemeanor is because I'm being prosecuted, not by the US government, which refused to prosecute me, but by a private Chevron law firm that that is captured the machinery, the prosecutorial machinery here in New York and has, has done this to me. So, you know, I was not totally surprised to get a six month sentence, even though the longest sentence ever given a lawyer for my level of offense was 90 days of home confinement. Um, there is a gratuitous, punitive element to what they're doing to me that is really chilling and scary. And people need to pay close attention to what's happening to me, because I'm telling you, this is the playbook to go after the climate movement and, and people really need to pay close attention. Absolutely. Um, what does it mean when you're being sentenced for six months? You said that in the past it was 90 days, uh, home confinement, but, but uh, where do you go now? Uh, what kind of, of, what kind of prison are you going to be taken to? What, 
what is a day in the life going to look like for you? Well, I, I don't know. Um, you know, they haven't that, told you. Well, this is sort of what's happening now. Um, we've appealed her decision to imprison me. What Judge Preska, who's appointed by Judge Kaplan, and she has Chevron connections through the Federalist Society, what she's trying to do, apparently, is force me to serve the entirety of my sentence on top of my two years of house arrest. Um, I've already served more than four times my sentence at home, but they're not counting that. So now I have to go serve six months in prison. Um, but I also have an appeal of the underlying conviction, which again happened without a jury, that I think is incredibly powerful. And I honestly expect to win my appeal, but that's going to take a year, year and a half to get resolved. And I think the trick that they're trying to employ is to force me into prison where I serve the entirety of my sentence before my appeal can get resolved. Thus, if I get exonerated on appeal, I still will have served a sentence for a crime I did not commit. But that's just all the big Chevron game. I mean, they're trying to keep me restricted and detained for as long as they possibly can. And sort of getting to your earlier comment about how, how no one's talking about it and wherever you are in Scotland, I mean, their whole goal with this is to silence me and to pre prevent me and others from traveling and to prevent people from talking about this kind of thing. So, you know, we have to keep speaking out and, and we need to continue to speak out. But I could go into prison if the Court of Appeals does not allow me to stay out pending my appeal. I could go into prison as soon as two weeks from now. And where would I go? I don't know. I would go into the federal prison system and you know, that's scary because there's a lot of dangerous prisons. And, and even though I'm at absolutely the lowest level security offense possible in the federal system, I've never committed a crime. I have no criminal record. It's a misdemeanor. Um, you know, given Chevron's influence and the influence of these judges, I fully expect for them to try to put me in a very rough institution. And, I'm, you know, and I think people also need to pay attention to that. Um, when you say you were convicted of a misdemeanor, can you just remind folks what that means, what a misdemeanor represents and uh, how, what it was? Yeah. So, so in the, in the, our system of laws, there's generally two main categories of crime. There's felonies, which are the more serious offenses, usually violent or involving a lot of property and theft. And then there's misdemeanors, which are very minor offenses that have a maximum of a year in jail. I'm actually the lowest level misdemeanor that has a maximum sentence of six months in jail, um, which I believe was a maneuver employed by Judge Prescott to deny me a jury because under our system, if the max sentence is six months or less, you're not in a criminal case, you're not entitled to a jury. So in my case, Judge Prescott locked me up for two years and then she was the one to determine my guilt or innocence after locking me up. And, you know, it was not a fair trial. Um, and then she sentenced me to the max, again, without a jury being involved any step of the way. So, um, you know, I think the process has been really off kilter, um, you know, abused by Chevron and, and its lawyers and these judges. Um, I've never heard of a person being prosecuted in America by a private law firm um, that has as its client the very entity that the person being prosecuted quashed in court in a major pollution case. Um, there's a lot wrong with this. Um, conflicts of interest throughout, flagrant conflicts of interest, um, lack of supervision by this private prosecutor, Rita Glavin, who, by the way, also represents Andrew Cuomo. I mean, she didn't answer to anyone in the Department of Justice after the Department of Justice refused to prosecute me. So there's so much wrong with this case. And the idea that I would have to serve my sentence before my appeal gets decided is, is really repugnant in my view, to the rule of law. You cannot find one person ever, or I've been unable to, convicted of a misdemeanor who has an appeal where a judge did not let the person stay out pending resolution of the appeal. This is a low level offense. And first of all, I'm innocent and I believe I'll get exonerated, but even if I were guilty, this is the lowest level offense possible in the federal system. And Hardly anyone ever serves a day in prison for this kind of offense. And she's putting me in prison for six months on top of two years of house arrest. It's an, it's an abuse of power, in my view. Um, that was my immediate thought was, uh, how are you able to be sentenced while you're appealing? the? I've, I've never heard of anything like that before. Um, are there other entities like the Attorney General of New York, for instance, or the U.S. Attorney General um, or, or, or other folks out there that you can simultaneously kind of come at this with? I, you know, you mentioned... Well, you mentioned uh, Cuomo, right. and obviously I thought of New York. That's a good question. I mean, I mean, you know, the New York Attorney General isn't really very relevant to this because she's state level, and this is a federal 
offense in the federal system, because in criminal justice, you have state offenses and federal. This is federal. However, Merrick Garland, the attorney general, is very relevant to this. And um, our team and our law- my lawyers have contacted him on, on a number of occasions trying to convince the DOJ to take over my prosecution from the private law firm and treat me professionally. I mean, I'm probably the only lawyer in America begging the DOJ to prosecute him, you know, because I just want a fair prosecutor. I mean, I believe a fair prosecutor would dismiss the charges at a minimum release me pending the final outcome. Um, which is what they initially did anyway. So we're begging and urging and trying to persuade the DOJ to step in and take over the case. And I think at that point, the case would end. I, again, I think it's an outrage that a Chevron law firm is mm-hmm. privately prosecuting the name of the public, you know, an activist lawyer like myself who beats Chevron in court and ends up locking him up. I mean, the only way to explain why I'm being treated in such a punitive way is because I'm not being prosecuted by the government. I'm being prosecuted Mm. by a private Chevron law firm. And by the way, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which is a very important body around the world, consists of five esteemed international jurists, just ruled my detention is illegal. It violates the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Both, Both of those are important legal documents to which the U.S. is a signatory. And, and the U.S. is obligated um, to to use those principles and those laws in its domestic actions, you know. So they've ordered the U.S. government to release me and pay me reparations for this deprivation of liberty. And again, that is something that Merrick Garland should deal with, because obviously the judges I'm dealing with here in New York are ignoring it. Um, if the Judges in New York were able to get away with this, this essential like private prosecution of you. How how can we be sure that uh, the DOJ can't do the same in some way or form? Well, I have a lot of faith in the DOJ, you know, as a, as a professional organization. Um, much more faith in the DOJ or the SDNY, which is the Manhattan uh, version of the DOJ, the prosecutor's office here in, in the city where I live. Um, so, you know... Look, whenever someone gets prosecuted, whenever someone is deprived of their liberty, it's important to be vigilant, and make sure the law is being complied with. You know, I mean, it's a lot of power, right, to, to take someone's liberty away. I mean, you know, I've been unable to live a normal life now for over two years. And the person who took my liberty away was was a private Chevron lawyer. So that's wrong. And I don't think the DOJ would let those kinds of abuses happen. And, you know, I have faith in the DOJ that they would handle the case professionally. And I think if it is handled professionally, once the facts are reviewed, I mean, I, the charges, by the way, against me, these contempt charges that Judge Kaplan came up with that were rejected by the DOJ are unprecedented in U.S. history. I mean, no one's ever seen this kind of thing. Um, he claims I disobeyed court orders, when in reality, I was litigating court orders and appealing them. It was just no one's ever been charged criminally for doing what I did, which was lawyering, fighting for the rights of my clients. You know, so I have confidence in the DOJ and I hope they'll take it back. I, you know, I have less confidence in sort of the, some of the political aspects about like why they're sitting on their hands and watching this human rights violation on U.S. soil unfold and they're doing nothing about it. I think that's wrong. I think they need to look at this closely and and step up. And I'll also comment, well, we're on the topic. I mean, none of my re- representatives, I live in Manhattan, you know, Senator Schumer, Gillibrand. You're my next question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Barry Nadler, I mean they, they're just completely silent. I mean, Nadler's son works for a Chevron law firm. He's ignored my calls and my efforts to enlist him, his help. Gillibrand, we just found out from an article in The Intercept, has accepted over $400,000 in campaign contributions from a Chevron law firm, Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. And, and uh, Senator Schumer also accepts a huge amount of money from fossil fuel industry law firms. You know, So there's, they've been silent uh, about a human rights violation on U.S. soil when they consistently criticize other countries for doing similar things. So you know, I would urge them to show a little courage and, and come visit me and learn more about what's happening to me. Because, I mean, this is just becoming an embarrassment for our country. It just undermines our moral authority to speak about human rights anywhere around the world. Um, b- before we wrap, uh, what can folks do? Are, are, are there any lawmakers we can turn or, is th- you know, is there any pressure we can apply for folks following? We have your website up on, on the screen right now, but, um, you know, please send us in yeah. any direction that'll help you out. 
Sure. And there's, there's another, uh, actually, I think we changed the website. It's actually free Donziger.com, but that, that site you have up also works Donziger defense, but you can also go to free and it's got the latest news about the case. I mean, I want to, I want to salute Jim McGovern, Congressman chair of the house rules committee, Jamie Raskin, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Corey Bush and Rashida Tlaib and Jamal Bowman, they all signed a letter to Garland asking him to intervene in my case. And that took some courage to do, particularly when my own elected representatives wouldn't do anything. You know, so I want to salute them. I want to salute the 68 Nobel laureates, um, including Jody Williams, the Peace, American Peace Prize winner and an old friend of mine who have organized on my behalf and demanded my release. Um, you know, the IADL, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, headed by Jeannie Mir. I mean, I've gotten a ton of support, um, but there's a real lack of accountability on U.S. federal judges who are lifetime appointed. And if they don't want to operate in the framework of the rule of law and they want to take advantage of their power, um, you know, and at least what I'm seeing in my case is these two judges seem to be getting away with it. Um, even though we're calling it out, they just keep doing it. And, you know, my six month sentence is just the latest example. I mean, I think it's a damn outrage for me to go to prison, um, even if I was guilty, because people don't go to prison in America for misdemeanors when they don't have criminal records. You know, and further, I have a great appeal where I believe I'll be exonerated. So the fact she's trying to force me into prison before my appeal can be heard um, is extremely disturbing. And, and I think an example of the problem I'm talking about, I just don't think they're playing with a fair, a fair game up there here in the SDNY in, in terms of my case. And she blatantly did say that this is sort of a warning sign for, for anybody else who's, uh, you know, looking to, 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 to basically I don't know, defend indigenous people. That's the only, or, or go after Chevron. <laughs> I, <laughs> She's always defended powerful interests. I mean, her, track record is extraordinary. If you look at the history of her cases, um, Jacobin article, my magazine just did a really interesting article looking at her history. And, you know, so, you know, I, look, judges have an ethical duty to be fair, right? To look at the facts, apply the law, not come in with these preconceived notions about who's right and who's wrong, who should be favored and who should be disfavored. But that's what she and Judge Kaplan have done repeatedly over the years with, with me. I mean, it just clearly have intense animus toward me. And John Kecker, who's one of the great trial lawyers in American history, who represented me for a few months way back in 2013, called this whole thing a Dickensian farce. I mean, this is a guy who's practiced law at the highest level for 40 years in America, and he says he's never seen anything like him. Marty Garbus, another one of my lawyers who represented Daniel Ellsberg, Nelson Mandela, among others, like he's like never seen anything like this in the United States of America. I mean, this isn't just me saying it. I mean, there's very respected lawyers who are extremely disturbed by what's happening to me. It's a warning sign. Um, Stephen, please keep us in the loop. I'm so happy that you were able to join us to talk about uh, the sentencing and, and, and get us updated. Uh, good luck. I hope that, you know, we drag out the appeals and prevent you from being sentenced. Uh, that would be wonderful. So, you know, whatever we can do to help I'll out, please, please keep us and I'm, uh, I'm hoping I won't have, to, yeah, I'm, I'll keep you posted. I'm hoping I won't have to go to prison. If I do, it might be soon, relatively soon. But I want to thank you for your support uh, over these last several months. And, you know, if I don't go in, we'll talk again. If I do go in, we'll talk hopefully when I get out. And maybe we'll be able to visit you. Yeah. I don't know your story from. Not that I wanted, but not that was that sounded so. That's not how I meant to say it. <laughs> Thank you for being a good sport there, though, because I did not come out the right way. <laughs> no, I mean uh, the, the point is is to tell the story of what's happening. Um, no matter what happens, we just have to keep the keep it going, keep yeah. the pressure on. So, thank you, Stephen. Have, have a great day. Thanks for what you do. You too. You too. Thank you. All right, we will be back shortly with Josh Fox. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Oh, I'm in a new location. <laughs> I promise I didn't break the show up into pieces. What actually happened was the Wi-Fi went down and I had to rush over to another building and find a space to tape because we are at a conference. Uh, conference life is back. I am also socially distanced. You might hear other people, but I'm very far away from everybody and everybody is vaccinated double and has had to take many, many PCR tests. 
because I know that the people in the comments are going to jump in on that. Uh, all right. My uh, dear, dear, dear friend, Josh Fox, is joining us today from an undisclosed location. Uh, Josh Fox is, of course, an Academy Award winning filmmaker. Uh, many, many, many things. We'll put it all in the info section because we don't have a lot of time with Josh today. So we're just going to get down to business. Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, I'm actually in the People's Republic of Brooklyn, which is um, uh, di- as disclosed as I can make it. <laughs> I know where that is. I know. I know. I, I know. know the fastest and it's easy way to, to get look there, up, but it's it's fine. You know. I also um, know the fastest way to get there from my house. You have to fight through the Hasidic collision shop that constantly parks cars in front of my door. Um, but if you do that, you're, in. you're a real New Yorker. That's what happens. <laughs> Hi. Right. All right. Josh, you and I both live very close to the water. Um, yeah. Will we have homes in the next five years? First question, go. Will we have homes in the next five years? Well, yes, we will have homes in the next five years. Uh, here, where I am on a little bit of high ground, um, there was an extraordinarily amazing piece in the New York Times, which really rung true to me as a person who also lives out in nature which was in response to what happened with Hurricane Ida. And now Hurricane Ida hit the southern coast of Louisiana, and it was absolutely devastating. I was down there um, trying to do some relief efforts by installing emergency solar panels at like community centers, tribal buildings, places where people could come and gather and get supplies and food and cool down. Um, But then the hurricane traveled by land all the way to New York and killed people, more people in New York and New Jersey than it did in Louisiana. Because Louisiana was ready. I mean, we were ready down there. Uh, as you know, I also lived there. And I, 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 we were not ready here in New York. So I managed to evacuate Louisiana, got to New York, and we got clobbered. And people drowned in their cars. People drowned in their basements. People drowned in New Jersey. And then in Pennsylvania, our, our power went out in, P- in PA. Right. So this is serious. What does this mean? Well, living near the coast, the sea levels will rise. Yes. But what is much more interesting right now is that in this city of New York, you have something called Canal Street. You also have if you look at the skyline of of New York City, Midtown is very, very tall and then it dips down. And then lower Manhattan is very, very tall where the World Trade Center is. Well, why is that? It's because the Lower East Side and the area between, like, say, 23rd Street and um, all the way down at Battery Park is a swamp. It was always a swamp. That's why Canal Street goes through there because there was a canal. Now, if you look in certain places in Queens where a friend of mine lost her car and flooded her basement, that used to be a lake. So water will go where it always has gone whether or not we built a city on top of it. So you have to look, Red Hook was a swamp, right? This, those areas that's flooded during Hurricane Sandy were areas that 150 years ago, topographically, were actually wet areas. So if you, it's like the same thing when a developer goes into some place in Louisiana and, do, and does a subdivision on top of what used to be a toxic waste dump, they don't tell people. They're not required to tell people. They're like, oh, well, I don't know why you got cancer 20 years later, sorry. Same thing here. Oh, we don't know why you're drowned in your basement because we built our our development on top of what used to be a lake. And guess what? The earth has been around a lot longer than New York City. So what we do have to do is work with um, what we call nature, which I don't like to call nature. We have to work with with the land and with the water to figure out how are we going to mitigate floods and all these other types of things. And that's on nobody's radar right now. It's, it's, it's on nobody's agenda right now. I mean, that's what's so infuriating right. is because you're seeing, radar, you know, we had a, um, a sinkhole in Manhattan, not in Florida, in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, where this happened just a few months ago, where a car was literally like eaten into the, into the, 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 the earth below it. And that's, that's New York City where, you know, a little coverage, they covered it in one of those like, uh, you know, daily uh, papers that you get in, in, in your email, like with crazy stories that happened in New York. Uh, right. The guy in the tree will leave the tree for three days. And the way somebody's car was eaten alive by the earth. Um, well, those, sort of, those stories sort of go together, right? Like you might want to have a tree nearby to, to climb. Um, well, but the thing is, about yeah. it is, as a, as a person who was born in New York City, but also raised in nature, I know seasonally 
uh, up in the woods in Pennsylvania, I know seasonally that in the springtime, this particular part, which is a depressed little thing in the summer, which looks like dirt and you can walk over it in the spring is a raging stream because that's every year. That's where the water goes. And um, I have news to us, New Yorkers and you that N New York city, even though there's all this pavement is actually on the earth. It is not a place that is the concrete does not go down like all the way to the bottom. There's actually dirt. And that's, that's the, that's what we're built on. So we cannot ignore the fact that the earth plays a hand here. And, and what we have to think about when we're talking about climate change, especially when we're talking about mitigation, um, not just in the sense of how are we going to survive it, but from the geographical standpoint of let's not flood or let's not fall into a sinkhole or whatever. But the principle of cooperation with the planet, which we've been living outside of for the last 500 years, which Western civilization decided we had dominion over the earth right? This idea of dominion. We, the humans, run everything. We are separate from nature. Nature, in fact, is a concept as is defined by Webster's as everything that's not human, which is insane. We are the earth. We are made of earth. We are going to be earth for a hell of a lot longer than we are human, right? Each one of our bodies will be. So we have to start to understand that we're in a co-creation with the planet. And that if we don't, if we don't relinquish this idea that we rule everything, we can extract anything we want, we can put anything we want in the atmosphere, we can put a building anywhere we want to put it, um, we're screwed. And not all of us, but those of us who have not been paying attention to those things. Rich people that I know, millionaires are going, hmm, I'm going to look at weather patterns and figure out where I'm going to buy a house. Oh, well, That's I mean, they, they have these crazy, you know, I've, I've been working in Puerto Rico and a few years ago, I was following around these crypto guys and some of their ideas, many of them were built off of crypto, which is just you know, another form of irony, uh, given the the, the the devastation it does to the environment and energy. Um, they are building like ships, like major ships where they and their favorite, you know, people on the planet um, and they're you know, the best doctors in the world uh, and their regenerative, whatever it is that they take and, and all of their, you know, pills that they take to live forever, they literally float from place to place. You know, when the next climate change disaster hits, if they have enough warning, they can get out soon enough and they can go somewhere else. They're going, they're getting on the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria and taking their crypto colonialism wherever yeah. is safest for them. And hopefully what happened to Christ Christopher Columbus will happen to them too. Well, I mean, <laughs> the real story of Christopher Columbus, what happened to him? Anyways, um, I, I don't so want to anyway, go down. What's the next question? The answer is you should, if you're listening to this, try to look up where you live and what uh, things you're going to be prone to. Because I actually believe what that the anti-fracking movement was so successful because it was the tiger right over the fence line. We knew that the chemicals were right there, all the soccer moms, and we all bonded together. And we said, no, we're not going to poison our children. We're get, get the hell out of here. Well, there's a tiger over your fence line right now. And that's climate change. It's not far away. It's not like this looming possible threat in the future, which we're not very good at responding to as human beings. You have to start to understand that there's a front, there's a front line of climate change. And you have to find out if you're on it. And if you're on it, you better work like hell to stop it with the rest of the climate movement. I'm I'm so happy you're bringing this up. Um, as our audience knows, and you know, I'm in Edinburgh right now to um, covering this TED Climate Conference, and you've been to many of these events before. And there are activists like, well, why are this event? And I personally want to hear what their latest sin is for the bad actors here. I want to be able to, as a, somebody covering it, not somebody you know in attendance, to be able to challenge uh, those who seem to be completely out of touch with the realities of what's happening on the front lines and especially in, in communities of color and with indigenous movements, because there's been a lack of that here. Um, but there's also some amazing activists here. So it's, you know, they, you know, they have to have like some real climate people here, otherwise they wouldn't get away with us. Um, but it's been incredible to see this moment versus five years ago, pre pandemic, when we would go to these conferences, how everybody's interacting. And I am really impressed with the boldness of of a lot of the youth leaders here, um, mm -hmm. the, the 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 leaders who are part of the intersectional movement in in climate change, um, many different organizations and activists, they just don't. One of them got up today at at an event and, and challenged like a spokesperson for Amazon, which we talked about at the top, 
And, uh, and he's like, if I'm not going to talk about it now, when am I ever going to have this opportunity to ask this question of Amazon and demand that they do something about this? So like, why would I waste this moment? I don't care if I'm never invited again. This is the moment because we don't have time. Simultaneously, I saw other people in the room being moved. Now, I'm setting up the stage because you know, they're going to do all they can to obviously try to silence voices. We see what's happening with Steven Donziger, who was on just before. Um, I interviewed him yesterday, in fact. But they can't get away. Well, he's (laughs) he's got a circuit, (laughs) right? But he, um, but they can't get away with leaving these voices out of the conversation anymore. But they are using new tricks, what they're doing with Steven, uh, co-opting youth now, um, you know, what they call youth washing, uh, which is a different form of greenwashing. I mean, what are the things that you're seeing now? Because it's not the same as it was five years ago. Um, and it's definitely not where where, we're, where we were uh, when we caught them off guard either. I, say the I want to talk about what is different in, in my perspective from five years ago. And I was talking about this last night on the film panel at the Chelsea Film Festival here in New York City. Um, five years ago, I went to Standing Rock and I was working with Rolling Stone and I was working with Now This. And Now This was a group of crazy kids that were like, put out these viral videos. And they had a kind of way to do this at Facebook so that when I put out videos, um, one of them went to 32 million views, which was the reason why the head of now this versus Sharma asked Obama about standing rock and got a response from him, which was a terrible response. But my videos from that period of time were 75 million views. Now I cannot do that on Facebook anymore. Facebook has gotten smart. They have decided that that's no longer in the human, uh, in their best interest. It's in humanity's best interest. Um, but now they put on all this other crap that you can't get away from, which is like weird videos of like people do committing adultery and stealing people. It's all fake. So we can't do that on Facebook anymore. Um, and that's a microcosm or rather a macrocosm of what's happening on a much, much bigger level with media. If we can't tell the stories, which is what I do, Right. Gasland, Gasland Part 2, How to Let Go of the World, Awake, A Dream from Sandy Rock, these films, right? You may have noticed that none of my movies, even though I've been making them for the last four years, have come out in major media because we have seen a consolidation of media like we have never seen before in the last five years. The Trump era was devastating. And I'll explain it to you in very simple terms. If you remember that you, when you went to the movies... You would see a movie that was created by Universal Studios or by United Artists or by MGM. And then you would be watching that movie in a theater, which was a Lowe's theater or a Cineplex Odeon theater or whatever. But it wasn't the Universal Theater. It wasn't the MGM Theater. Because it was thought back in the day that to have the distributors of movies and the creators of movies be the same people was way, way, way too much power. So at one point in time, America broke up Hollywood and said, you cannot be in charge of what you get to make and what you get to see at the same time. That's the situation we're in now. Hulu, Disney, HBO Max, um, Universal Plus, um, uh, the the big six, Discovery. They make content. Netflix, how would I forget them? And they also distribute the content. With Amazon. That's what I was getting to. Those are the six. Okay. Amazon, uh, uh, Discovery, which is now gobbling up HBO, um, Hulu, Disney, uh, Universal Plus, Amazon, and Netflix. Okay. That's it. Now, there are some independent companies like mine that make movies, but with them making all of this content, we don't have any place to go. It's way, way, way too powerful. So you have to break up Amazon. You have to break up Netflix. You have to break up Disney and Hulu, and you have to break up HBO. They should not be allowed to make the content and distribute the content at the same in the same building. Those are two. Those have to be two entirely different companies and two entirely different accounting structures to entirely different groups of people. That's this. But the situation we're in right now, which where you're not seeing the new great climate change movie, you're not seeing the new great story about, about, about fracking. You're not seeing the inspirational tale about how people uh, moved their entire village because it was a floodplain. I don't, I don't know. You're not seeing any of those stories, right? It's, it's they're a, being made. It, but, they're, right. But, but every time I go into a pitch 
with a studio to pitch a movie about anything, anything at all. It could be about coronavirus, it could be about nature, it could be about uh, climate change. The producers always come in and they say, before, you, before we start, just make sure that your pitch is not political. And if they do reject what I'm doing, it's always, well, this was too political for us. I got news for you. Every single piece of art, every single right. piece of content in the world has an ideology. Every single one. If it's not in opposition to the status quo explicitly, then it is supporting the status quo by simply meaning that their, their opposition is absent. Their criticism is absent. So everything that you watch on Netflix, everything that you watch on these channels, um, the most popular stuff is all in support of a fossil fuel based capitalist model that is exploiting workers, that is exploiting people, and that is destroying our ability to live on this earth very, very, very fast. <laughs> so if we're not doing so, that's my, my big thing with the last yeah. five years. We're seeing enormous climate movement, uh, Greta and the youth, but, but we are not getting to tell those stories. And our ability to reach people independently over what we used to call the internet, because Facebook has now designed the algorithms to make sure that we're not getting out there. Um, that's a system of extraordinarily it's, problematic it's, control. It's not just Facebook. It's I mean, Facebook, obviously, and Instagram, which is a big part of this, right. and and even Twitter, and and uh, and of course Google. I mean, I have personally seen a a freeze in growth in a way that doesn't actually logically make sense. Like. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, yeah. you know, you, you can see the engagement and then you just, if you've been doing this for a while and I have been, I've been on these platforms since they started all of them. Um, right. it just doesn't have the same, uh, sensibility given the interest of how much people care about this issue right now, when you go, um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, granted I live in a community where people care about these issues, but they're also on my online community. It's a reflection, you know, they, they, they work hand in hand. Um, I'm so glad that you mentioned, yeah. though, the political side, because <laughs> it's kind of become a joke at this conference. You know, quietly, we're saying things like, oh, you know, it would solve that. Oh, I don't know if somebody came out and said, uh, maybe we should figure out a way of challenging Bolsonaro, uh, who's, you know, completely wrecking the Amazon. They keep saying, we need to protect the Amazon. We need to protect. OK, cool. So why does your company, um, you know, let's talk about the intrinsic relationship that I think one of the most dangerous men in the world has right now with completely wrecking the global ecosystem. Forget about just Brazil. I mean, it's, it's the consequences are dire and, and that is fascism. I mean, seriously, it's like the word that they don't want to discuss is fascism. No one wants to say the problem that we have right now is that the right is finally I heard someone say the right is going further and further right. And the centrists are just further and further frozen. Don't know how to deal with, um, but further and further right is fascism and it's driving everything right. So I know you talk about this a lot. Can we just touch on the danger of fascism and the climate um, for a few minutes? Well, fascism is the ultimate idea of dominion, right? It's not just dominion over the earth, but it's dominion over all people. Right. Authoritarianism is responsible for wars, death. I mean, the Holocaust. And I, I am very worried that because the Democrats in the United States, for example, have so um, embraced people like Joe Manchin, people like Kristen Sinema, frankly, people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, um, because we moved away from the Bernie Sanders um, FDR, democratic socialist society, which took care of people, which addressed economic inequality, which, by the way, also was a really, really, really good at addressing the climate, right? Um, we moved away from that. We decided that, I'm not going to say we, um, because, you know, our whole system is corrupt. It's run by oligarchs. It's not run by people. People want lower prescription drug prices. People want action on climate change. People want a, a better minimum wage. People want all of the things that our political revolution, which was not really a revolution. It was more like a common sense um, democratic socialist agenda, which preserved a great deal of this American free market system while taking care of people, taking care of the climate and making sure that we weren't getting ripped off at every possible minute. But we have decided not to, we, you know, so Bernie and that message is still incredibly important. And that's where but the problem is that, you know, we, we are not living in that world. And then when you don't give people what they want, 
because by the, in terms of the democratic party, not giving, not doing, um, you know, the de- cancellation of student debt, the cancellation of medical debt, the, the basic payments during COVID, the, um, the raising of the minimum wage, the, the securing of voting rights, the infrastructure bill, action on climate. When you don't deliver that agenda, then the weird middle of this country that decides to completely stay ignorant of, 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 of uh, their whole pl- political philosophy is just throw the bums out. So they throw the bums out and guess who, what happens? Re-entrance of exactly. Donald Trump. But, 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 but I also think that there's something really important here for us as a progressive movement to just sit in for a second. And I include Bernie Sanders. Um, have been very close with having uh, been part of the Democratic Party reforms in which um, behind the scenes, many of us were, 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 we felt like we gave up on the fight a little bit too early and negotiated a little bit too much um, or didn't focus on the right things. And I think what's really, really important is the ideas are great. The implementation is what makes it work. Everybody knows that. And I worry sometimes. It's like, yes, he had a great climate plan. Yes, the platform was fantastic. Nobody implements the platform. Nobody implements his platform. And And even the Green New Deal, I mean, is it... Do we have a plan to move that forward and get those votes and and well, move we, the people that we need to move or whichever? I mean, the infrastructure bill is a perfect example because I think the reason why people are so furious about the infrastructure bill is that you're starting to see the complete bullshit of the two people who are holding it up. And now we're starting to look at different directions out of necessity, saying, Joe Manchin um, or Joe Biden, excuse me, why aren't you putting pressure on, on Joe Manchin? Don't sit here and say you don't have the power. You have all the carrots and sticks, as does Chuck Schumer. And so, so right. it's we're learning the process by experiencing it because it really has come down to, to a very small margin. But the truth is, uh, you know, I don't think we talk enough about how to implement these big ideas. What does it mean to break up monopolies? How do we do that? Who do we you know, pressure antitrust laws. Well, I mean, I, think, I mean, how do we do that? Who are the votes? Well, we it's need like to get? on the we Delaware River, them. you know, when when they when they clear cut the forest and all the logs were on the, and then they jam up and nothing can get down the river. Right? There's a log jam, and that log jam is the filibuster. And we we can solve that if we solve that. And and but the log jam is also these two people who are who have decided that they are kingmakers, and they. Um, I mean, it's just the Senate, the Senate, the Senate, the Senate, the Senate. But right? again, if we could figure Biden, out how to, if we could yeah. figure out how to get DC statehood, that is a, a way to break Christian Cinema and and Joe Manchin. Unfortunately, they are in charge also. of getting. What's that? <laughs> it has to They're, push through Congress. Have to go through them, right? So, so the issue um, of the project of what you're saying, progressives, right? The basic project of Bernie Sanders and what we've been doing this last, I don't know, 10, 12 years or my whole life is just to try to get people educated on what this actually means. I love going to rooms in New York city full of rich people and turning them into revolutionaries. I love going to places in rural Pennsylvania and finding our common ground. And I watch Bernie Sanders go to West Virginia and talk to coal mining workers and say exactly the economic arguments that won them over. Yes, but we're not. Watched, I am, but, but, but if you're invested in that system, which is Wall Street and blah, 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 yeah, blah, yeah. And big business, you're not going to have the ability to do that. So what we're trying to do now, I think, is find ways to continue that education that says, listen, you're not, you shouldn't be not on our side. We economically should be allied with a lot of those white middle class Trump or, or Trump voters, we should be economically aligned, and we have to speak to that. We have to speak in terms of economics. We have to say to the coal miners in Wyoming, by the way, your job is going to go away no matter what. So we have to give you a better job. And if you were, are with us and with a union mentality and with a minimum, you know, if, and with the Green New Deal, we can ins- ins- ensure that you have a really good job in the energy sector going forward. But you have to make that argument. To those people, yeah. and you have to go to them and make it, which is what I loved doing, traveling the country with the right. political revolution, which is what I love watching Bernie do. Josh, we have to wrap. I, I love you. You're the best. Thanks for joining us uh, for Climate Week. Glad we had a one on one. Come back soon, okay? Absolutely. Thanks,
Welcome back to the Nomi Keys Show. As you know, we are here in Scotland for the TED Countdown Conference focusing on climate. It is Climate Week. We're in a loud convention center, as you know, uh, but it's exciting. And we're, we're really thrilled to have somebody who is here from New York, who is one of the attendees uh, at the TED Conference, who uh, has a a company that is focused on sustainability in fashion, which is a, a, a growing area and well overdue. Um, we're very excited to have the founder of the CurvyCon. Can we have Cece join? Cece Olis is the founder of CurvyCon, and she is just like a few rooms away from me. <laughs> she can probably hear me right now. <laughs> Cece, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Of course, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So, um, for folks who aren't familiar, uh, can you explain what, just in general, sustainability is, and then what fashion sustainability, how it emerged, like where it came from? Yes, so I, I have to admit, it is such an honor to be here in Edinburgh with TED Countdown. Um, just a little bit about me. I feel like context is always important in these conversations. I'm co-founder of the CurvyCon, which is a plus-size fashion convention that takes place during New York Fashion Week. Uh, but I got my start as a fashion blogger. And being a fashion blogger that creates outfits that inspire the 67% of American women who wear above a size 14, it's a special job. It's a job that is part fashion, part creativity, part inspiration, and definitely part activism. So when Ted invited me to this conference on climate change, I knew immediately that I'd be looking at climate change through the lens of fashion sustainability. But I will be the first to say I am new to this. So I am not going to be like your big time expert on all of the, the data and all that kind of stuff. But I am getting a lot of clarity on what everyday women can do. So when it comes to sustainability, the big thing that has been really breaking my heart is understanding that fashion is the second biggest contributor to these emissions in the environment after oil. So it goes oil, which everybody knows is kind of like the bad guy in this situation. And then right after that is fashion, which we all take part in. So that to me is my biggest takeaway from what I've been learning right now. And that's a big, intense thing that we can all kind of chip away at a little bit. So, so let's, yeah, let's go at this because, it, it, you know, there's supply chain issues. Um, there's farming issues. Uh, I mean, can you kind of roll through why and obviously fast fashion for, for maybe explain what that is for folks who may not be familiar? Um, why all of these issues play into being such a large contributor um, to emissions? The amount of clothes that we all own in our closets is exponentially greater right now than what our parents owned and our grandparents owned, right? So imagine that, just to consume more from a clothing perspective, that already says a lot about what fashion is doing to kind of push the needle in the wrong direction for climate change. I think that there are a lot of connections between um fast fashion and human rights issues as well. There are a lot of things that are going wrong. Like this issue is a human rights issue as much as it is a world issue, right? So being able to connect all of those dots, at least for me, feels really overwhelming. Um, but what I'm, I'm looking at from the fashion perspective is as everyday people, I got an email from someone from my community yesterday, and she said, you know, I love that you're a TED and you're doing all this, but there's nothing we can do unless we are like at the top of these companies or in politics. And it's like, I understand that feeling, but there has to be small actionable steps that we all can take. And those are the things that I'm focusing on, like while we're here. Um, how are people receiving this? I mean, we, we, we were talking at the beginning of the show about how I was at a lunch and an Amazon executive was there answering, uh, questions from the audience, which didn't really, uh, go well in, and, and supply chain, uh, was brought up and then labor standards were brought up and then mm -hmm. how it impacts communities in which they set up their operations. And of course, you know, to pull it all in, how politics and, and tax policies, um, you know, are incentivizing more and more, uh, you know, wrecking of communities, destruction, uh, not getting the right resources back into the communities that they, they affect. Um, you can see a lot of similarities. People look at Amazon as a tech company, but it's 
distributing every, everything, obviously. Uh, I, there's, I think a lot of it is rude and there's a lot of similarities in, in fast fashion. So how are folks responding to what you're, what you're talking about? I can say for me, it's been, it's emotional. It's like you hear all the information and it feels so overwhelming. You see um, the rivers like shrinking up in these in these simulated videos and it feels super overwhelming. But I think one thing that I've learned as a plus size fashion blogger, as co-founder of the Kirby Con, is some of the best activism we can do is with our spending. So it's like we can all hear about fast fashion, but if we're still showing up to those stores week after week, day after day, then obviously it's not that big of an issue for us, right? But how can we start to change the way that we engage with fashion? So those are some of the things that I've been exploring um, in the breakout sessions that I've been a part of and with my community online is looking at literally the slow fashion movement. I am in one of my favorite fall outfits that I have been wearing every autumn for the past three years. And every time I put it on for the first time, in any season in the past three years, people go crazy for this outfit. I used to be someone that would say, oh, I'll never wear the same outfit twice. But now I'm looking at what are the ways that I can have an outfit that I wear over and over and over? How can I take one look and turn it into three ways? Doing that alone will scale back my own personal consumption. So if we're all doing that, then suddenly these fast fashion companies, sometimes it feels like one closes and three more open in their place, right? Like we got rid of Forever 21, and now we've got Shein and Amazon Fashion, and it's like it just keeps going. But if we stop consuming at the same rate, at some point, dollars and cents tends to be the one thing that everyone can understand. So, looking at how we spend our dollars, slowing down our spending, and making our clothes things that show up in our wardrobes and in our outfits all the time, even on Instagram. You can post multiple pictures in the same outfit over time, and that should be a sign of pride and accomplishment that you're doing what you can for the planet. Okay, so for, for our audience, they know that I, I live on, I've been living. Um, I've been on the road a lot last uh, few months, uh, filming a documentary and and otherwise. And so, somebody said to me the other day, "Oh, I saw that when you were uh, in Greece, you were wearing the same outfits you were in Puerto Rico." And I'm like, "Are you actually paying attention?" It was a guy. And I don't care. We're left to show. No, but I mean, but I didn't understand because this is not the world I operate in at all. I didn't understand yeah. the pressure that all these other industries kind of they have an effect on the other. So I bring that up because if you're an influencer and you're a fashion influencer, you are tied into this possibly tied into the system through social pressure to continue yes. to contribute and also push these other industries. Um, you know, I know yes. a lot of these, these companies now have like sustainable lines as does Amazon. They have like green products, um, but it's not enough because consumerism is, is exists and, and, and these companies, you know, it's like a game of whack-a-mole, as you said. Um, how big is the movement the sustainable movement right now in terms of sustainable fashion, uh, uh, reusable, recycled materials, as well as, you know, like vintage fashion, uh, which has obviously grown in the last few years as well. I think that's the thing that I find so inspiring about sustainable fashion is that you can approach it from a lot of different perspectives. So as someone who is very passionate about plus size fashion, I can be very frank and say, Fashion hasn't really shown up for plus size women. If I walk into a vintage store, there's not an abundance of quality clothes in a size 16 or an 18 or whatever I may be, right? So when it comes to plus size fashion even catching up, there will be more fashion that needs to be made. I'm working on a fashion line, but looking at sustainability from the beginning. So I don't have to be like a Levi Strauss or some big company that's trying to make a U-turn with the Titanic. Instead, it's like the newer companies that do need to serve the underserved. How do we show up in a way that serves the humans on this planet who want to be stylish and have great clothes? And how do we also make sure that we're not contributing to the things that are heading us in a really bad direction when it comes to climate change? And then you have your people who are like the Gen Z TikTokers who are cutting up t-shirts and turning them into something else and going to vintage stores and doing these 
extravagant halls with vintage fashion. So depending on where you are, where you're coming from and what your connection is into fashion, there are so many entry points into sustainability. And I find that to be very inspiring. I think anytime we say you have to do it this one way, it becomes really limiting and off-putting. And everyone's already super overwhelmed by climate change, right? So I think breaking it down into actionable steps that really feel doable for each of us where we are is inspiring and super important. Um, has there been any kind of conversation about how, uh, whether at COP, which is happening in a couple of weeks, or the global, global community is, is setting standards so that, um, you know, there's many ways that can't be, these companies cannot be regulated in terms of how much they sell, for instance, but there are other regulations in terms of what type of farming in their supply chain, like how does the supply chain operate? Have you heard anything that the government, because yes, consumers are important, but obviously it, it, it'll mm-hmm. make a lot more impact if it comes from Uh, world leaders? Yes, I think it's definitely the fastest approach for us to get this taken care of is kind of from the top down. And so looking at what are the ways, obviously our local governments are the best way to kind of start those conversations. And then looking at, I was having a conversation with someone who was um, working in like forest preservation. And he was saying that even the chocolate that we eat, we can research candy to buy that does not kill trees, right? And it's like, I didn't even know that I should be looking for those things. So I think for us to find out who are the companies that are are not saying like, oh, we've already kind of depleted a forest, but we're just going to try to keep it at the status quo. But what are the companies that are saying, no, we're, we're actually engaging in not depleting the forest and building the forest back up, right? So we, for me personally, what I'm learning is, I need to be looking for the companies that have solution-based practices, solution-based, you know, that that's how they're built, um, as opposed to the ones that are kind of like trying to, like, kind of take the shortcut around. I think polyester um, is, the, is a really good example. In fashion, everyone is saying polyester needs to go as a fabric in general. And then there are people who have come out with a more sustainable polyester. But when you wash it, what goes into the water, the fish eat that instead. And then we've got the same problem again, where the climate is changing because nature is having access to things that it shouldn't have, right? So even when we try to do better, it's like if we're still kind of doing it from a man-made synthetic way, there's still ways that we just are getting involved in the planet that we shouldn't be. So again, I know it's overwhelming, which is why I say kind of pick your poison, pick your path. If it's the forest that inspires you, if it's fashion sustainability that inspires you, we're all going to have something different that's a passion point for us, but we all have to find a way to be like hands on deck, super active and super actionable. And also calling your politicians and telling them that this is important and that you believe that this is real and that you want them to put policies in place that hold these companies to task. So again, all of that is things that we can all do. Phone calls, being activists with our dollars, things like that. Um, you know, there's just a, throwing this out there, but there, there are many materials that are in a lot of these fabrics that um, are toxic to whether it's the environment or to humans. Mm-hmm. You know, they're now coming out with more research that people get rashes off of certain things. Um, that's an easy area yes. where you can kind of take on some of these companies if you want to go to your lawmaker in your community, in your state, especially if it's a democratic state, uh, you can probably push and say ban this, just like they banned BPA, just like they banned, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the U, they banned a lot more in, in terms of, of health. So, so many different avenues. CC, thank you so much for for sharing this, this side of climate change and what people are trying to do in the sustainability movement, which, you know, is really diverse. Um and uh, and especially when it's related to consumerism, I think it's it's it can be tough because you know if we the other aspect is that climate change is affecting how much we can produce too. Um, you know we're seeing it in the food movement a lot where uh, crops are not producing the same levels of whether it's uh, grapes or wheat. Um, you know if you have drought, you have floods that all affects the crop for that cycle yes. and and hurricanes of course. Um, and the same thing has to do with materials that we have. So uh, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Very thoughtful conversation. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Cece.
And thank you to everybody uh, for watching today. Make sure to check us out on Friday. We're having Fem Friday, talking about climate again. Uh, thanks to Cece, thanks to Josh, and of course, thanks to Stephen. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, some of your questions, because I'm curious, you know, what else I can bring up um, while I'm here? Tweet me, tweet me, hashtag TED Countdown, because we want them to see the tweets too. So if you have ideas, if you have thoughts, uh, if you think that I should bring up, find some folks to interview, please, please, please send them my way. Um, I will do my best to address them. In the meantime, stay in solidarity. The No Mickey Show. We clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed. Deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue, talking heads left is best. The saga continues, continues. The No Mickey Show.